All right, welcome everyone. We have an exciting update on SEPTA's trolley modernization program, a once in a generation opportunity to, to truly transform the nation's largest trolley network, delivering benefits across the region. Uh, we do want to note that we'll be recording tonight's presentation so that we can share it later online with those of us that, that could not join us. Um, go to the next slide. And one more after this. So I'm Ryan Judge, I'm the Director of Strategic Planning here at SEPTA, and I'm joined by Jen Doherty, who's the Manager of Long Range Planning here at SEPTA as well. We also have Anna Lynn Smith from HDR, who's the team that is supporting SEPTA with the design of the new trolley stations. Next slide. So we'll start off with a brief overview of why this program is so important to our region, provide an update on, on a few ongoing studies that we have underway right now, then walk through some new station design concepts that we're hoping to get your feedback on both tonight and in the, the weeks to come. Go to the next slide. To help us out with this effort tonight, you can submit questions or comments using the Q&A function, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll also be using polls later on to get your thoughts on station designs. And we'll run a test poll now to see, um, make sure that works for everybody and get some feedback on, on what rides you, what trolley routes you use today, uh, if any, so we get an idea of who's in the room. All right, so a good mix of people from across the system today. Um, this is helpful for us to know where we should be targeting more, more outreach in the future as well. Make sure we're reaching as many people as possible. Let's go to the next slide. So trolley modernization is one of SEPTA's key initiatives that, that came out of SEPTA forward, our strategic plan. It's working in tandem with other projects such as bus revolution, reimagining regional rail and project Metro to, to make sure that we're making transit more useful to more people. We're doing this by creating what we refer to as a lifestyle transit network that consists of frequent, all day and all week services that connect people to a range of destinations across the region. To talk about what that means in the context of trolley modernization, I'm going to hand it over to Jen Doherty, who is going to walk through some program overview updates and background on, on why we're doing this and, and really set the stage uh, for some of the station design concepts that Anna Lynn will walk through after that. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. I'm going to start off with a quick program overview. Like Ryan said, trolley modernization is a once in a generation opportunity to transform the nation's largest trolley or streetcar network, making it accessible, fast, and easy. Our trolleys have played a critical role in our region since the 19th century. Um, you can see here, here's a uh, an early version of the Route 10 headed off to Overbrook. Our new vehicles will not be having a uh, the ability for people to hang off of them. There'll be no handholds there, but we uh, we know that we're building off a long tradition of serving this region. And we're working um, to make sure that our current vehicles, which has served communities since the 1980s, are gonna be replaced with vehicles that are modern and accessible with new vehicles, new stations. SEPTA is transforming trolleys to meet the needs of riders today and tomorrow. So trolley modernization includes new longer vehicles that hold more passengers and feature low floors and ramps, wider pathways and open space for people with wheelchairs, walkers and strollers. Um, you'll also be able to bring your bicycles on board with the new longer vehicles. New on-street stations that are well-marked, safe and fully accessible and rebuilt existing stations that are fully accessible with improved amenities like elevators. Infrastructure and operational improvements to facilities, signals, and stations to make service faster and more reliable. And proposed line extensions that, that enable us to reach more destinations and connect to more SEPTA services, improve our operations, and have new, larger passenger and operator amenities. This project encompasses our entire trolley system, all eight lines. Pre-COVID, we had about 80,000 uh, weekday riders, daily weekday riders. And what's great about this project is its wide reach. Um, over half a million people live within a walking distance of our eight lines, not even counting those folks who can easily transfer to these lines. So that is about 14% of the region's total population will really be directly impacted by this transformative project. So this is a very complex decade long pro project that is gonna be done in phases. And we're gonna take this phased approach to limit service 
disruptions. We're gonna be starting with the city trolley tunnel first, and then moving on to the T lines, which are the today's 10, 11, 13, 34, and 36. Then to the D lines, uh, the Media Sharon Hill lines are 101 and 102. And then finally our G line, the Route 15. Benefits of trolley modernization are wide reaching. Um, one, one of the things we wanna point out here is that this program has um, great benefits towards equity. Um, it will improve transit access in communities where 59% of the population are people of color, which is a higher rate than the region at large. As with every transit project, there's gonna be climate benefits. We're gonna lower levels of air pollution by speeding up service and reducing the number of car trips taken in our communities. And so know that there'll be benefits to our communities by strengthening existing conditions, by improving transit services that link workers to jobs, students to school, and diverse communities to each other. Um, and this gets back to our lifestyle network and really building up the community by providing accessible, fast, and easy to use service. And then finally, we've worked with, sorry, you could go back for a moment, uh, on jobs. So there's benefits there as well. We've worked with eConsult to calculate um, what we believe are the benefits of this in terms of um, catalyzing over 38,000 permanent jobs across the region and improving access to over 350,000 jobs, including those in University and University City, Center City and University City, which are our two largest employment centers in the region. So as I've said, we have three goals for this program. To make sure that the system is accessible, fast, and easy. And I'm going to take a little bit more time to talk through each of these goals and how we're going to be accomplishing them through this program. Our first goal is accessible. Create a fully accessible trolley system with new vehicles and stations that are built for universal access. We accomplish this, of course, through our new accessible vehicles with low floors and ramps and with new on-street accessible stations. Fully accessible subway stations with elevators and higher platforms and fully accessible SEPTA right-of-way stations with ramps and higher, longer, and wider platforms, as well as audio and visual messaging systems. Second goal is fast. Deliver faster service with modern signal systems and roadway space prioritized for transit. Fast means higher capacity vehicles, no step boarding, all door boarding, frictionless fare payment and stop rebalancing. So this is really gonna change the way that you get on and off the trolley and how much time we're spending at stops or stations and that will really be enable us to speed up our service. Other things we'll be undertaking really have to do with roadway operations and design. So transit signal prioritization, double tracking and switch improvements, which you'll mostly see on the suburban side. Transit supportive development. Um, so there we not only want to avoid conflicts with auto-oriented uses along our existing transit corridors, but also encourage um, more folks to live and work along this corridor and have more convenient access to the system enforcement of parking rules in coordination with curb uses and reduced power outages, which is really a SEPTA project. And our third goal is easy. Provide an easy to use trolley system with highly visible stations and consistent service. We accomplish this by having wayfinding with clear signage, maps, station and route naming, real-time information, comfortable vehicles, visible stations with consistent passenger amenities, regardless of what neighborhood you're in or what line that you're using, route extensions and connections, coordinated and consistent schedules across modes, and operator amenities. I'm gonna go a really quick run through of some of our current projects. This is a wide reaching program with many different elements. And the most, one of the most visible ones is, of course, this is all prompted by a new vehicle acquisition. Our new vehicles um, will be low floor, articulated, higher capacity, 
and fully um, Americans with Disabilities Act accessible. Um, they're gonna work, our new vehicles will work with our existing system constraints like the tunnel and our right-of-way space. We put out a request for proposals to vehicle manufacturers this past May, and we're expecting responses this October and moving forward with the vehicle acquisition process in the new year. So new vehicles will require new stations and new platforms. Our operations and capacity study is another system-wide study that we're undertaking. The purpose is to look at existing operational conditions on the network and identify both short-term and long-term improvements that will mean faster, more reliable trips for our customers, more frequency for more of the day, new boarding procedures, um, promote intersection improvements and roadway operational changes. We're working to quantify what different improvements to intersections, signals, um, enforcement, roadway design mean in terms of time savings for trolleys so that we can advocate better with our partners to see changes happen on our streets. We're also fortunate that we received um, a federal grant to make um, improvements to 19th Street and 30 st 37th Street stations in our tunnel. Um, this will make those two uh, stations, which will be the first of our tunnel stations, in addition to the work that's already happening or underway at 30th Street and 15th Street, fully accessible. Um, this means new elevators, raised platforms, new head houses, and other passenger amenities. And finally, just want to mention our Blossom at Bartram Complete Streets project, which is looking at a particularly unusual and dangerous stretch of roadway in Southwest Philadelphia in the King Sessing neighborhood. And this is looking at how we can, sorry, how we can build um, accessible trolley stations and also make sure that the street is redesigned to be safer and accommodates all uses, users. Improvements include new signalized intersections, trolley track changes, new pedestrian and bicycle facilities, and redesigned intersections. And with that, I wanna turn it over to Anna Lynn Smith, who's gonna talk more about one of our trolley modernization projects, which is station design. All right, thanks, Jen. So our station, trolley station design project is part of realizing what Jen had mentioned as the three trolley modernization overall program goals of being accessible, fast, and easy. So as part of the design process, we went through research on best practices for different um, transit agencies around the US. A thorough understanding of what SEPTA's real world station footprint needs are and constraints in a variety of different operating environments and station type areas and neighborhoods. Just like tonight, we are looking to get public and stakeholder input on station design throughout the process. And this is just one step of the way in that journey. And then our process looks at designing conceptual modern trolley stations for the entire system, which includes the shelter, includes the head houses in Center City, University City, includes consideration of things, amenities such as seating, signage, and waste receptacles and also incorporates the design of the platform. So from a, a design standpoint, a lot of what drives the station platform and where it is and what it is has to do with the, the vehicle platform interface. And so as you can see in this graphic on the right, that the ramp is one of the, the main components of the vehicle that will meet the platform at the edge and provide that connection. There's an outside button on the door to release the ramp. There will be ticket vending machines on board. And a big advantage is that there's no operator assistance necessary for folks that use mobility devices. And to ease boarding, to, to make the service more fast, uh, this system uh, with trolley modernization also provides multi-door boarding with the new vehicles. So what we've heard in the process, um, the goals of the, the overall outreach are to raise awareness of the program. Educating is huge about the program goals and elements and getting input 
from stakeholders and the public on station design and how they interface with, with the roadway. So thus far, we've had over 4,000 online respondents to the first round of surveys conducted over the summer and uh, over 1,000 interactions at um, 10 in-person events throughout the community served by SEPTA's trolley network. So in terms of what we've heard, um, picking your top three in terms of uh, what you're looking for, these, uh, the first question in pink here on the left, what would you prioritize when considering station design? Pretty overwhelmingly, yeah. so we listed a bunch of characteristics and these, these features, these characteristics influenced uh, some of the station's designs, which I'll talk about in a bit. Top three here, um, safety, first and foremost, far and away, green, and we're, we're asking a question uh, in a current survey about, you know, what can we do? What does green mean? But green, historic, given the historic character in which uh, of communities, many of the communities which SEPTA's trolley network served. And then kind of ranking down in order of, of interest or durability, consistency, warmth, artistic, bold, and minimal. So the top 10 open-ended responses by category, this is just a high level that most folks are very supportive of, of the project overall. Folks are very interested in making sure that there's greater station accessibility, which is, is for sure, um, top of mind when we're going through the design process, making sure that there's dedicated um, fun, dedicated trolley lanes and that there's uh, trolley traffic priority. And then coming down in, in importance here and ranking enhanced safety and security, which ties into the design over on the left, support for additional uh, bike amenities, improving the reliability and frequency support for reinstating old trolley lines that, that came up, and finally, support for expanding the lines. So here, boiling it down from that first round of station outreach is safety, green, community character, and easy to maintain. So this is, um, these four goals were permeating throughout our design process. In terms of safety, the station platforms are constructed alongside the track and block traffic from, from passing where the trolley customers um, would be waiting. So, and the platforms are also um, going to be featuring crash protection. It's intended for them also to be well lit with transparent materials such as glass shelters to be visible. Uh, also improved communications, real-time information through information screens and audiovisual announcement systems are, are going to be part of this, this new and improved trolley station experience. For green, things that we'll be considering include incorporating sustainable components like stormwater management, tree plantings, and bike facilities, and making sure that there's consideration given to using sustainable building materials and lighting um, throughout the process. In community character, we're looking at making sure that these, these stations are distinguished. You know that it's part of the trolley system and consistent to look similar across lines and neighborhoods. And that, but yet at the same time, they're also complementary and integrated into the neighborhood and not a jarring juxtaposition within the existing context of the community. And there's also the intent to uh, customize panels depending on the line, depending on the information that needs to be shared to, to reflect um, perhaps an opportunity for community input or artwork that would be considered. And then easy to maintain. We know this is very important throughout SEPTA's entire system. So making sure that any, any materials that are proposed um, and the way that they're built is comprised of robust and hard wearing materials. Materials considered include steel or laminated glass or glass block, as well as concrete, strong and durable. So from here, we go over to the context. And the context is taking um, what we've considered as part of the design process and making sure that we're applying it to the real world, the real world of SEPTA and the trolley network. 
So the exact station designs that are gonna be in deployed will depend on the type of street that they're located on. So this graphic here provides uh, an overview, a visual um, representation of where different street types are located along the trolley network. And you can see there's five different types, color-coded, um, curb extensions in blue, floating island plus bike lane in green, floating island plus split lane in yellow, Gerard Ave, dedicated right-of-way, mostly in Delaware County, and then the tunnel in University City and Center City. And so this next series of slides goes into some detail, um, providing a little more insight as to what, what it means and give a visual representation of what they are. So this first one, floating island plus bike lane, is that the bike lanes are actually located behind the station platform, which results in what's called a floating station island. And you can see these are mainly the West Philadelphia, portions of the West Philadelphia routes. And you can see here, we have a graphic that shows the bird's eye view, gives a protect, uh, bird's eye perspective. And so some of the features to be called out here are that first off, there's new ADA accessible platforms and ramps. They're about 100 feet long provided at all stations, and that the bike lanes will then pass between the station and the sidewalk to reduce conflicts and increase safety. Throughout all of the stations in the network, there's going to be improved wayfinding signage, so you know that you're arriving at a trolley station and where you, where you are in the system, as well as enhanced visibility through new lighting fixtures around each station. Shelters themselves will be provided. And these shelters will provide weather protection, greater comfort, as well as station visibility. The next type of trolley platform is a curb extension. And this station platform is constructed in the existing transit zone and parking lane meeting the track and provides accessible boarding in that manner. So again, this also encompasses some parts of uh, Girard Avenue, um, the G line, as well as um, some other portions of SEPTA's trolley network. Details for the curb extension are that the new platforms are, will actually be extending the curb to provide near level boarding and serving all vehicle doors. So there'll be a transition between the parking lane and the platform to sh show that, to ensure that vehicles do not block any platform access. And then crash protection measures are provided to help guard or protect riders from vehicle traffic approaching the platform. The next typology is called a floating island plus a split lane. And so this is mainly along the G line or Girard Avenue 15. On, and this is on multi-lane roads, the station floats between the vehicle travel lanes to provide accessible boarding while accommodating vehicle traffic. Bird's eye view here can see with number one, the uh, outer lane of vehicle traffic is rooted behind the trolley platform using the existing parking lane. And then bollards or other safety measures provide crash protection at, at the edge and at the crosswalk. Barriers are also provided to protect, protect riders behind them from vehicle traffic. This next typology is a dedicated right-of-way, mainly in Delaware County. And this station type is used when trolleys have dedicated right-of-way or travel lanes. Uh, stations, are adjacent, stations that are adjacent to vehicle traffic will need additional platform width for crash protection. So we have two bird's eye views here uh, showing the dedicated right-of-way. And this, in this example, you can see that the track is separated from vehicle traffic except at intersections, kind of like what it is today. SEPT is going to be coordinating with the municipalities to increase accessibility at these stations by connecting the stations to the, an existing and expanded sidewalk and curb ramp networks. And similar to some of the other options, uh, typologies or platforms, bollards, barriers, and other safety measures will be provided for additional crash protection. This other bird's eye view shows where there's no roads adjacent or parallel to the, the exclusive right of way. And here it's uh, same as before, separated from vehicle traffic, except at intersections. 
as similar as before, SEPTA will continue to coordinate with the mun various municipalities to increase the accessibility by connecting the trolley stations to the an existing and or expanded sidewalk and curb ramp networks. And additional shelters will be provided. You can see with number three, those are the, the historic um, shelters that exist along some of the stations and making sure that um, they remain while being new shelters would be consistent with the overall look and feel um, in the region. And finally, we have tunnel stations. And tunnel stations is, are um, found in University City and Center City, providing underground trolley access in those two neighborhoods of Philadelphia. Bird's eye view here, the um, elevators will be provided. Big, big improvement. Elevators provide station access for all passengers. You can see that head houses will be constructed over the stairwells, offering protection from weather and giving the stations greater visibility. So these will be transparent, they will be well lit. And then similar to other typologies, there will be improved wayfinding signage at each station and sidewalks could be widened where necessary for new facilities, further improving pedestrian access. So from here, we migrate to shelter design and thinking through our design process and getting your input on that. So in terms of shelter considerations, um, bare, at a bare minimum and consistent throughout our design process, they must meet SEPTA standards for passenger comfort and maintenance. We need to make sure that we're not encroaching, we're maintaining an ADA required space and path and that path of travel remains clear. And we're also making sure that we're designing and branding the stations themselves to identify trolley service as part of SEPTA's metro system. So there's two, two features that we'd like to go into a little bit more detail tonight. Uh, the shelter colors being one of them, being standardized and used as another component as the overall trolley branding effort. And then the shelter shapes, which can help riders identify trolley stop locations, knowing you've arrived at a trolley station. So we have two different shelter shapes tonight. They are, um, it's only the, just the look, the look and the feel of them. They are fundamentally the same in terms of dimensions and the ADA path of travel, but we'd like you to get your input this evening on the shape. Shelter one is a simple rectangle shape. You can think of it maybe as forming the letter L upside down with the back wall and canopy and additional supports that form the side panels for protection from weather. Shelter two is a bit more of an expressive, expressive angular shape. It forms an X or a K. Some people have said it looks like the SEPTA logo uh, and at its sidewalls, and it has a solid base supporting a light canopy. So from here, we'd like to do a poll and, and find out from you which shelter shape do you like the best? Okay, we have shelter one, the L at 63%, and shelter two, the K or the, the X at 38%. Great. All right. The second part of the questions for this evening has to do with the colors and what you see as your preference. Um, so we have three choices to go through. The first is the cool color palette. And cool colors can evoke calmness and sleekness. And we would be applying the colors to um, the, the back panel, perhaps to the roof, perhaps to the bench um, in different ways and in different intensities. But here you can see with the shelter one style, the cool colors applied. We go to shelter two to give you another perspective with the, the X or the K. See the, the cool colors applied there. And then the next series or choice is a warm color palette. Warm can be thought to evoke warmth, obviously, and comfort. And you can see it applied here in similar ways to, to the inside roof, to the, the, the walls of the station, perhaps to the bench as well. So this is the L um, or shelter one, here's shelter two. 
And then the third choice has to do with line identity. And this is um, expressively showing the metro service. Depending on where you are in SEPTA's um, metro network and on the trolleys, um, you can understand what station, what station or line you are on. And so in this case, you have, you see the head house with the green, you see West Philadelphia with green, and then you see an example of Delaware County in pink. In addition, uh, the G lines, Gerard Avenue, would, could be yellow. So here you see it on the L shape or shelter one, shelter two. And here you can see them compared side by side. Cool, warm, and line identity. Here we go, another poll. What shelter colors do you like the best? All right, what did we find? Okay, cool tones came in at 15%. Warm tones at 31, and then more than half, 54% of folks said line identity color, so pink or green or yellow. Great. So from here, I would like to turn it over to Christina Arlt, who will guide us through Q&A. Great, thanks, Anna Lynn. Um, we have had some questions coming in through the chat but I know that not everyone can see the chat, only the hosts and the presenters can see the chat questions. So I know that um, Jen has been answering some of them, but I'm just gonna read some of them again so that everyone can hear the question and then hear the response. Um, so one question that we received was, what inputs have you gotten from SEPTA employees such as trolley drivers? Jen, would you like to take that one? Yeah, in addition to conducting outreach around this project, we've also conducted inreach. Um, we have spent whole days out at our different shops and depots, so Elmwood, Woodland, uh, Victory, and Callow Hill, and we're going to be going back out um, starting Friday um, and over the next two weeks to solicit operator and maintenance um, staff's uh, feedback on the program. So um, what we've We've heard a lot from the operators about the operational challenges that they face in terms of how roadways are designed and how they operate, um, a lot about enforcement and fouling of the track. Um, and we've also heard a lot of excitement from them that they'll be in their own separate cab. Um, so, uh, you know, some operators even said, maybe I won't retire. I'll stick around to see that. So we've, we've um, gotten a lot of great feedback. We've also gotten some really nitty gritty feedback on things like schedules, on terms of run cutting and all those kinds of behind the scenes things that we hope that we'll be improving um, in the short term and doing an even better job of with modernization. Great. Um, Kyle asks, if ramps require a button, would someone in a wheelchair be able to easily reach the button to lower a ramp without being in the way of the ramp? That's a great question. So the, the button will be um, kind of, I guess, what would be if, you, if you're standing and you're an adult kind of at waist height, um, and then you'd be able to press that button both on the interior and the exterior if you need the ramp. And uh, the button and pressing the button will not get in the way of the ramp deploying. This is a standard feature on modern streetcar and light rail vehicles. And there's some great videos out there that show how these ramps work with wheelchair customers. So, I mean, that is something that perhaps we could add to our FAQ or something like that on our website to show exactly how this will operate. But it's out in the wild and it's working on other systems. Great. Um, this is more of a comment than a question, but um, Daniel says, seems like a missed opportunity to implement parking protected bike lanes, assuming Harrisburg gets around to permanently legalizing parking protected bike lanes at some point. Yeah, Dan, that's a great point. Um, it is something that has come up with us being um, moving the bike lane between the station platform and the existing sidewalk is whether that condition could continue down the entire corridor. Um, some of the corridors that we operate on may not have sufficient right of way to move the parking, I mean, move the bike lane curbside um, in order to have that buffer space between the parking and the bicycle lane so that folks don't get doored by people who are, who are exiting their car as they're parking. 
So um, we have brought that up with the city and it is something that we're gonna be looking at as we modern, modernize each one of these corridors and looking to make operational and uh, traffic improvements along them. Um, Jacob asks, has there been a study on safety or dedicated bike lights for bike riders coming behind the trolley lines going straight when cars are attempting to turn right? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I think what we're getting at there is that afraid that if you, let me see if I'm getting this right. If you're in the bicycle lane and you're behind the platform, there also happens to be a trolley there at the same time. Will you be visible to traffic as you enter into the intersection? And I think um, the way that we've designed this, maybe Anna Lynn or Greg might want to um, step in and talk a little bit more here, is that the trolley will be lining up with the um, with the full height of the platform and won't be sticking out over the ramp portion of the platform. So we'll need to ramp up from the crosswalk from the intersection itself to get to a 10 inch high curb height. And the trolley shouldn't be kind of beyond the stop bar or beyond the crosswalk that would block that portion of the intersection. So it'll be daylighted in that way. So hopefully that will um, make for good visibility for cyclists and you won't feel like you're invisible as a trolley is um, stopped at a station or at a signal. So um, don't know if that quite answers the question, um, but I think that's a consideration we can take. We can you know, maybe look a little bit more closely at in terms of what is that bike interface once you get to the intersection and how good is the visibility. Sorry, Anna Lynn or Greg, I don't know if you want to step in and try to answer that. Yeah, I no, I, 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 as far as I know, you're right. Nothing has been done in that regard to, to do that study, but just to fully understand and explain, I think we can do that as part of the typology to understand what that, that interface would be to, to make sure that the cyclist is visible and not, yeah, like you described, hidden Anna Lynn. from right turns, yes. Anna Lynn, this is Patrick. Um, there's one countermeasure. I think if you could go back to the design with the bike lane, we might be able to point it out. It's not lighting related, but I think it'll help with the problem that the um, participant is asking about. So um, one of the things you'll notice here is in this diagram, if you look at um, number three, it talks about uh, improved wayfinding signage, but if you look in the diagram just to the left of number three, you'll see a small island with three bollards sticking out of it. And one of the things that we've looked at in designing the stations is that um, the North American city transportation officials, uh, folks who have studied a lot of movements in cities and these types of situations, have found that when you force a vehicle to go further forward and then make a harder 90 degree turn to go right, they have to slow down to make that turn. Um, also, by coming farther forward, they're more likely to see a cyclist emerging from behind the shelter coming into their path. And often it helps for the motorist to make contact with the, um, the bicyclist eye to eye when they're still about 15 feet apart. So, um, well, you know, definitely lighting. Uh, that's a great question for us to look into. This um, little island, and you'll see it uh, on the top side of the intersection below the number one, protecting cyclists coming behind the other um, station there. That is what that island is there for. It's to force the motorist to turn a harder right turn at a slower speed and to potentially make eye contact with a cyclist to prevent a collision. Hope that helps. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Another question that we received is, um, where will the new trolley garage be built? I assume that this is referring to the maintenance facility. That's a great question. So our, our new trolleys are going to be longer and low floor um, are, and they will not uh, fit in our current shops and facilities. Um, the bays aren't long enough, the turntables aren't long enough, and with low floor vehicles, um, all the equipment is moving um, to the top of the vehicle rather than on the bottom of the vehicle like the current Kawasaki's and PCC's are built. So uh, looking at um, whether we could modernize our current facilities and keep them running and operating the trolleys and deploying them, it just it just the space isn't going to work out. 
And so we need a new maintenance facility. Um, this will also help us consolidate a, a lot of facilities which are dispersed and a lot of uses that are dispersed um, into one location. SEPTA has been doing a site screening to identify a new maintenance facility for a few years now. We've been looking at um, industrial sites um, across West and Southwest Philadelphia that are adjacent to our existing network. We've been looking for um, sites with large acreage. We've been looking for sites with um, historical industrial uses. And we've been looking for sites that have minimal um, environmental issues or are within any kind of a floodplain or anything like that. Next, tomorrow, um, we are taking um, a site to the board um, for their approval so we can move forward with a new maintenance facility. And that um, site will be in uh, the King Sessing neighborhood and we'll have more information on that after the board meeting tomorrow. Um, and uh, we'll be doing a lot of public outreach and communications around any new facility that moves forward at such. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, Michael asks, after this project, will there be insights into reactivating the shutdown North Philadelphia trolleys, or is that too far in the future? That's a great question. We get that question probably once a week. Um, is, are you going to be um, doing new lines? Are you going to be restoring service to deactivated lines? And the, the answer is we're really focused on modernizing these eight lines. It's a very complex program. Um, that we have right here to make what we have today accessible, fast and easy. Um, and we are gonna be taking some small extensions for most of the lines in order to kind of reach um, new end of line destinations with better connectivity and enables us to have better amenities for both our customers and our operators and will enable us to have the physical room and space to um, store these new longer vehicles and have ADA accessible platforms um, at these locations. I think that understanding, um, you know, that folks are going to probably be really excited about trolley modernization. They're only going to get more excited over time as we see, um, you know, new stations being built and the new vehicles running on our lines that we're probably going to get even more inquiries about, will this come to my neighborhood? Will you be adding trolley service elsewhere? And I think it's a really um, interesting question for SEPTA to ponder on uh, what kind of qualities are we looking for if we were to expand our trolley system? And I think that uh, us being able to um, quantify what those things might be, population, um, employment centers, uh, do we have the roadway space for it? Where would the trolleys deploy from? Where do we have all those kinds of things? Those are all the things we need to consider in terms of restoration of service or new service. And I think uh, it's a great question and something for us to kind of maybe um, you know, have some uh, thinking around it, prepared, because I'm sure we're going to continue to get that question as the project um, moves forward. Great. Um, Paul asks, is there a consideration to implement free transfers for those transferring from the L, for instance, to the trolley? Uh, well, there's free interchanges at our current stations between at 13th Street Station, at 15th Street Station, at 30th Street Station, and then if you have a key card, that first transfer is baked in um, within a certain time period, even if you're not within a free transfer area. So I don't think they're going to be um, maybe any additional kind of free transfer areas, but um, you know, I think that's also a fair policy question that we could, you know, ask a little bit more about. Great. Andrew asks, will we know which companies' vehicles will be considered or hired for the new trolley fleets? It's a great question. So SEPTA has done a lot of research on, uh, you know, what manufacturers are out there. And we've done a lot of outreach with the manufacturers to understand what vehicles they have available that are um, kind of off the shelf and whether they meet SEPTA's uh, systems constraints, um, our kind of unique track situation, our, um, our tight radiuses. And so 
Um, you know, we, we know that there is a kind of a short list of manufacturers who have that kind of vehicle um, that could work with our system. And we're excited to see who responds in October to our vehicle RFP that we put out this spring. Um, and we'll be, um, you know, I'm sure that our vehicle engineering folks will be very busy over the next few months evaluating all the proposals that come in. And there should be an announcement of who receives that award in 2023. It is a short list of manufacturers, though. And I think if you do some Googling around streetcars, you'll, you'll come up with that uh, short list of names pretty quickly. All right, our next question is, how and when will the 40th Street diversionary routing be active after modernized trolleys? Will SEPTA give advance notice to when trolleys are diverted, including through the real-time alert system? Yes, that'll be, that's a, that's a major part of real-time is that we're gonna be doing a better job of detouring and hopefully with modernization as well, we'll be needing to take the trolley tunnel out of service less frequent, frequently. Um, and you'll be seeing a lot less of those divergions up to 40th and market um, improvements to the trolley tunnel, including waterproofing, in addition to um, communications and signal systems improvements and uh, ADA accessibility at our tunnel stations are all gonna be a part of trolley modernization. And so hopefully reduce the amount of time that we have to use that diversionary track and go on diversion. There's always gonna be things that are um, unpredictable where we may not be able to, you know, there might be an emergency in the tunnel or something like that, and we'll need to divert um, in a non-planned kind of way. And that's a great time for real-time information to come into play and for those audio visual announcements to be used, which currently we don't have the capacity to do on our system today. Great. Um, Paul asks, is there also a consideration to implement car-free dedicated right-of-way on streets where there is currently mixed traffic? It's a great question. Um, and we asked that question when we did our first round of public outreach is to, to kind of gauge um, public support for um, roadway operational improvements, whether that is um, transit signal prioritization, intersection redesigns or trolley only lanes to kind of see, um, you know, where the public stood on those questions. And we heard overwhelming support um, for all three of those things, even amongst um, non septa riders or non trolley riders. And um, I think that uh, you know, clearly that makes uh, septa operations um, better. We're able to go faster, it's safer, there's less conflicts. And that's something we're going to be exploring on right of right of ways where there's sufficient room is whether we can work on a more holistic design um, that goes beyond uh, accessible stations to kind of rethink entire roadways. And it's really important to have um, public feedback and support for large projects like that, um, as well as us being able to use our operations and capacity study to um, evaluate and to quantify what the time savings are, what that does for our reliability. So we can make compelling arguments with our partners who control those streets, because it's not SEPTA right of way. So working with a, whether it's the city of Philadelphia or Delaware County municipalities um, and PennDOT to really reimagine some of our transit corridors. Andrew asks, when is there an estimated date already chosen? When will plans for all confirmed elements of the project be announced? So I think this is a timeline question. Uh, that's a great question. So a lot of this is, is us trying to figure out kind of what is the what is the order of things and how long are they going to take? Um, and we're we're still working out uh, kind of the master schedule and timeline for trolley modernization. Um, you know, we expect this to take the better part of a decade. Um, we expect the vehicles to kind of be on property in about five years or so. Um, and we know that we need to, before any vehicle goes out into service, that we need to be able to deploy it on a, an accessible line. So line needs to have accessible stations, needs to have those operational improvements, needs to have that end of line improvement, any 
you know, power or bridges or anything else related to it needs to happen before those new trolleys can be deployed on any on our, our first line to be modernized. So we're going to be seeing a lot of construction, a lot of work out there on the tunnel and then our city trolley lines and in anticipation of those vehicles coming down the pike. Um, improvements to um, our maintenance facility and our um, shops and where we deploy is also going to be a number one priority um, so that we're prepared for when one of those new vehicles come on property. Um, so as the project develops, I'm sure we'll be able to provide additional information through our website and a more refined timeline um, as the program continues to evolve. Um, Lucas has a question about whether the ticket machines on the trolleys mean that proof of payment fare policy will be happening on the trolleys outside of the underground stations. Yes, we'll be moving to proof of payment. Um, Michael asks, with speeding up trolleys, has a general stop spacing guideline been determined yet? I would guess that the general basis is at least a station at every intersection with another route. There are many factors for where stations are going to be built. Um, station spacing is really important. That's something that we're discussing right now with bus revolution is what is the appropriate stop spacing on lines. And so looking at moving probably to about maybe in every other block configuration, but there's lots of other things that we need to think about in terms of constructability for these stations. So do we have ta tangent track? Is there a signalized intersection? Is there a safe pedestrian crossing? Uh, is there a bridge structure or a grade issue that we need to be mindful of? Um, is there, um, do we, where are driveways? Would we have to close driveways? Would we have to close legs of streets? Um, and there's lots of lots of considerations for where station siting is going to happen and different things that we're looking at in addition to ridership and of course where those cross bus routes are those are kind of our must-have stops and so then we need to figure out from there where do those platforms go what do we need to do to ensure the platforms can be built in those locations um, so for each one of the lines you're going to be doing a, a corridor study and doing outreach to the public um, about um, station siting and other improvements, trolley modernization improvements to each and every one of our trolley routes and corridors. John sort of had a similar question about sta station spacing, but um, his additional part of the question says, will street boarding be eliminated on the whole system? We will, so with the new vehicles, with the new modern low floor vehicles, we will not be stopping if there's not an ADA platform. We, we know if the system is not accessible, um, it is a, it is a two sided, two sides of the same coin. So you need that station and you need the vehicle. So we won't be able to just stop in street. Um, the ramps are not designed to, to deploy that far. The ramps are designed to be um, cover a short gap and a short distance, and that enables us to have a much shorter dwell time. It enables the operator to remain in the cab and not to need to come out of the cab to assist um, the wheelchair customer or the mobility device customer with the ramp. So um, now we'll, we'll no longer be stopping in street, we'll only be stopping at platform locations with the new vehicles. Great. Gabriel asks about sanitation vehicles. So will sanitation vehicles be required to stop on side streets while collecting trash instead of on trolley streets to prevent trolley delays? Uh, we have not had that conversation with, uh, with the street sanitation yet. Uh, we are aware of lots of, um, we already work with street sanitation in order to try to uh, limit uh, how much time is spent on trolley corridors. So the street sanitation is supposed to just do one block before then they then turn on to a number street. Um, and so we work closely trying to minimize disruptions with uh, street sanitation to our schedules. Um, and, you know, there are many other enforcement and uh, fouling and blocking issues that we have on these corridors that we're also gonna be you know, working with our partners on in addition to street sanitation. 
Great. And our final question, given the curve radius for the eastbound 34, will 40th Street portal receive special attention for track realignment and further pedestrian improvements? Yes, 40th Street portal will be fully modernized. Um, it does have some tight, tight track um, radiuses. It also um, does not have ADA platforms yet. Um, and also we need to look at the amount of tangent track that's available for those ADA platforms, the amount of straight track that we have available for those platforms to make sure that we can put the new longer platforms in and have um, ADA access to those platforms. And so we'll be doing um, kind of a, a full redesign of 40th Street Portal, and that will be one of our first projects coming up. Um, and we're already working with the city of Philadelphia on their 4,000 Woodland um, Complete Streets project to make sure that the improvements both in the short term and the long term that they're making at 40th Street Portal include um, our modernization scenario. So we'll be, you'll be seeing a, a new uh, fully accessible 40th Street Portal in the future. Great. Well, thanks everyone for your questions. If you think of any questions after this webinar is over, feel free to email planning at SEPTA.org and we'll be sure to answer them. And then I'll throw it back over to Jen for the next steps portion. Thanks, Christina. Lots of great questions. Um, lots of uh, interesting things for us to start um, updating our frequently asked questions on our website with. Um, so next steps for our station design project is that we're gonna refine the station designs based upon public feedback like we heard tonight. Um, so please help us spread the word. I, you're all very uh, well-connected people. I recognize a lot of the names here. So appreciate you pushing this out through your social media channels and to your friends and your neighborhoods that use the system. We're gonna be doing additional public outreach um, after this round of outreach in November. Um, and there we're going to be talking about our preferred station designs, the feedback that we gather today, and then we'll be working to close out this particular um, project within the trolley modernization program. So you can learn more at planning.septa.org. Um, here's my contact information. Please feel free to email me. And also, this is the contact information for Dennis Stefanski, who's in our engineering um, maintenance of way uh, department, uh, who is the uh, program manager. And you can also email Dennis with any maybe your more technical engineering questions. And thank you all very much. And as you can see, Christina put in the chat some additional links to um, our website and to our survey. Thank you, everyone.